Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Steven De Vos, also known as the weightlifting dermatologist. I'm driving home from a conference in Brussels about aesthetics and anti-aging. Next is a video I took from a session I followed by Professor Dr. Brigitte Valkeniers, head of the Department of Endocrinology of the University Clinic in Brussels, about the topic, are hormones the holy anti-aging grail? After watching this video, please leave your comments under this video and give this video a thumbs up if you agree with all that is being said or not. Uh, Welcome to this channel. I am Dr. Steven de Vos, the lifting dermatologist, and this is my bro science hunting partner, Danny Bossa. If you want to learn more about the most cutting edge science based information in the world of hormone optimization, please like and subscribe. Click the bell button to get notified. I also invite you to join my other YouTube channel, The Lifting Dermatologist. The link you can find in the description of this video. So, as I am an endocrinologist, I would like to tell you something about hormones and the aging. And I don't have any disclosure. As you really emerging, you have a very big chance of getting 10 years old. Which is a little bit less than a new monocle or in Italy. And is the main cause of death in Europe are the cardiovascular diseases and the lung cancer. So this gives a big opportunity for the anti medicine, which tries to slow, stop, or even reverse the phenomena related to aging. And as you see, it's a very big booming business. What we do know is that people who do not smoke who are physically active and who have a moderate alcohol intake and also eat a lot of veggies and fruits, the bluish one, live longer. So this one live longer than those who don't do any of this. But what about multivitamins or multiminerals? Well, it looks like using multivitamins or multivitamins doesn't really help. It might make your urine a little bit expensive, but that's it. <laughs> the Mediterranean diet does help. And it's even better when you live in that region. I'm not sure how many of you had a soft drink during the break, but it looks like it's not very healthy. This is very recent data which shows that when you drink two soft drinks a day, you have a higher risk of all causes of mortality than those one who drink only one a month. And there is no difference between drinking the normal one or the light variation. And it's the same if you are woman or male, if you smoke or not, it's not depending on your BMI, physical activity, and alcohol consumption. And this brings me to the physical activity. I will not talk a lot about it as we have another session about it, but here you can see how important it is to keep moving. We do sit a lot for our jobs or to watch TV, and you can see here then when you sit eight hours a day and you move only five minutes a day, you have a higher chance to die earlier than those who sit less than four hours a day and move around one hour a day. When you move one, around one hour a day, there is not much difference between the four groups, so it doesn't matter if you have a sitting job. But what about the hormones? Are they symptoms related to hormonal changes? And can the hormonal treatment have an impact on the life expectancy or life quality? We do know that aging comes with a lot of changes, that the growth hormone is decreasing, as well as the IGF-1, that the estrogens and the testosterone are also decreasing, and that the androgens, which are synthesizing adrenal gland, are also decreasing. So yes, we do know that in women, when they are around 50, 55 years old, there is a sudden increase 
of the estrogen with body menopause. In men, there is a little bit difference. There is also a decrease of the testosterone, but it's much slower. In both genders, there is a decrease of the androgen levels as we get older, and in both genders, there is a decrease in the IGF-1 and in the growth hormone. So then comes the question, are the hormones the anti-aging pills? I'm talking about these four, about the estrogen, testosterone, androgens, and growth hormone. During menopause, there are a lot of changes in the female body. There are changes in the mood, in the skin quality. They also have a bigger chance to have cardiovascular diseases, to get osteoporosis, and to have urinary incontinence. And when we do give hormonal therapy, we do see benefits. We do see that the cholesterol is decreasing, that the skin elasticity is becoming better, that they do have less hot flashes, less urine incontinence, and there is a benefit on the bone density. But what about the interventional studies? This is one of the biggest ones published a lot of time ago, and you do see indeed that when you use hormonal therapy, there is a decrease in the hip fractures. There is also a decrease in the of cancer. But what you also see is that women on hormonal therapy, and this was a study which lasted seven years long, do have a higher chance on coronary heart disease, on stroke, on coronary embolism, and breast cancer. So yes, after the publication after this study, the prescription of the hormonal therapy decreased in a lot of countries, as you can see in the USA and also in the UK. But we do have to give hormonal therapy to women. We just have to find a window of opportunity. It's best to start it around pre-menopause and to stop it when they are 60, 65 years old. You have to choose the right dosage, the right drug, and to stop it whenever necessary. And this brings me to the testosterone. As I showed you, the testosterone also decreases, and when men do get symptoms, we talk about andropause and hypogonadism. They might have a lower strength, they might get cardiovascular diseases, they might become a little bit fatter, and they might get osteoporosis. The chance is higher in males that are older than 70 years old, they are, that are obese or that are smoking. And here you can see that there is a normal increase of the testosterone with aging, but in men with the hypogonadism, the decrease is a little bit faster, but still, only 2% of them do need treatment for the symptoms. And yet, the most important uh, reason for late hypogonadism is the obesity. As you can see here in the red line, the higher the BMI, the lower the testosterone level. And the best treatment, of course, is to lose weight. As you see here, only a 10 to 20% decrease of your weight would increase a lot of your testosterone level. But it's not very easy to lose weight. As you sometimes go for a cellar, you will end up with more calories, more fat, and less protein than a double Big Mac. Do we have to treat males with the testosterone? Yes, we do, because as you see here, the green line are the males with low testosterone, and they do live less than those with, which has a no, who have a normal uh, level of testosterone. And when you give testosterone, there is an increase in the muscle mass, an increase in the fat mass, an increase in the libido, and of course, a better quality of life. But do we have to give it to everybody? 
Could it be dangerous? Yes. And here you can see that there is actually an optimal level of testosterone, which has an effect on all causes of mortality. And this is true for the testosterone for the total testosterone and also for the free testosterone. Whenever the testosterone is lower or even higher than the optimal range, you have a higher probability of dying. And this is a very confronting article because people were worried about more chance of cardiovascular diseases in males treated with testosterone. And in the upper part of the figure, you see all the articles which were sponsored. And it looks like there is no difference in the cardiovascular diseases. But when you look at all articles that were published and were not sponsored, it looks like testosterone is increasing the cardiovascular complications. So for testosterone is the same. We have to use this right dosage to give it to the right person and to stop it whenever necessary. And this brings me to the third one, to the androgens. For a very long time, people were talking about androgen as being the fountain of youth. Actually, they are produced in the adrenal gland and they are the precursor of testosterone and estradiol. And one of the first studies showed that we really do have uh, effects on the bone quality, on the libido, and on the skin quality. But in men, there were no benefits. And there were also no effects on the cognitive function. Of course, that was only the first study. And after that, a lot of people tried to see if this is indeed a hormone that everybody has to use. But as you see here, a meta-analysis shows that there is little influence on the sexual function of libido, on the cholesterol, on the blood sugar, on the bones, or on the BMI. And these are all on postmenopausal women. But what about males? Well, you see here that there is not enough evidence to use this to improve the cognition or the mood or the sexual functioning but it does decrease the fatness. This is also a very recent publication from the Belgian Society of uh, Gerontology, which actually does not uh, recommend the supplementation with this hormone in order to improve the muscle mass, muscle strength, or physical performance. And unfortunately, we don't have any data about the cardiovascular diseases when I somebody is using this hormone or about the stroke management. So now I have to disappoint you. This is definitely not a fountain of youth and there is not enough evidence-based medicine for it. The most interesting story is that of the growth hormone. It does increase with aging, but you see the highest level is when you are 20 and 30 years old. And it's lower when you are 60, 70. It's almost the same in older female and older males, but the pulses are getting smaller and smaller as you age. And when your growth hormone is decreasing, there is a decrease in the muscle mass, an increase in the fatness, and a decrease in the quality of life. And this was the first study that was published about growth hormone. It was a very small study with only 21 males that were healthy and that were treated for six months with the growth hormone. And they did show that it's good for your new body mass, for the adipose tissue and also for the skin. But what appeared in the media was totally different. What they said is that by using growth hormone you will get 20 years younger you will be stronger and you will have more energy. Of course, this was a big opportunity for the companies to produce growth hormone, 
And then it was said, that is the healthier thing you can do for your body. So, yeah, these were the results in 2014. But we do have to use growth hormone whenever necessary because it does increase the fatness and in that it does increase the leanness. But whenever you use too much of the growth hormone, you could get hypertension, hyperglycemia, hypertension syndrome, or even a lot of uh, edema. And this ends the story of the hormones. So with this, I show you that there is a lot of research done about the hormones and the hormonal level. Nobody knows what is the perfect level we have to reach in elderly people. And it's definitely unclear if the treatment with hormones is beneficial. And no, we didn't find yet the magic pill. And the question for the hormone of youth still carries on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, time is open for questions. Uh, do you have any questions? Raise your hand. Okay, I have one question for you. We see some doctors, well, they are not, of course, endocrinologists, but some of them are very well known in the place, in the spot, and they are just prescribing the patients a drop of the hormones, a drop of the DHEA, a drop of growth hormones, um, and leaving them put this, this uh, as, as an impact. Well, unfortunately, you can buy all these hormones also online. Uh, like you really so, even the type of hormones, you can just buy them from Canada. It's not really a problem. So, legally, well, you, 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 you can, even if you're not uh, an endocrinologist, just to prescribe that kind of hormones. I mean, for uh, a okay. well, based uh, doctor. Yeah. What we do see is a lot of complication of, of these uh, treatments because women are ending up going to the cardiologist because they have a lot of uh, palpitation of problem with the heart. They do uh, get uh, uh, some other problems from the, from the treatment, uh, especially from the cortisol, also from the young hormones. So it's, uh, yeah, you, you need to give the right treatment to the right person, and that is okay. And the problem is that usually they do start with the treatment, but they never get a follow up if they have complications for the treatment. Okay, any comments, questions? Okay, thank you very much.